ராமானுஜதயாபாத்தைராகியபூஷணம் ஸ்ரீமத்வெங்கடநாயம் வந்தே வேதாந்தேசிகம் லட்சமீநாதசமாரம்பாதயமுனாமியமாச்சாரியபர்யம் வந்தே குருபரம்பராமேதிமே சஹசிரநாமத்துல்யம் ராமநாமபராணே ராமாயமாய வேதசே ரகுநாய நாயா பதயே நம ஹரி ஓம் தீநாராயணர்ப்பணமஸ்து நமோ நம சுஸ்வாகம் In Sanskrit, that means hello and welcome. Firstly, I'd like to offer my gratitude to Sri Lakshmi Narayana Temple Mahalakshmi Trust for giving me this opportunity to share some of the nectar or amritham from one of the great itihasas of india which is ramayana so thank you to the temple trustees and thank you to the divine power that is continuously and consistently manifesting in the form of sri lakshmi narayana that allows us to live to love to give and to forgive what is shrimad ramayana in fact it can be summed up very simply in seven lines the whole of the ramayana can be summed up in seven lines the first line talks about a specific kanta ஆதௌ ராமாதோவனாதிகமனம் தென் ஹத்வா மிருகம் காஞ்சனம் தென் வைதேஹி ஹரணம் ஜதாயுமரணம் தென் சுக்ரீவ சம்பாஷணம் வாலி நிர்தலனம் சமுத்திரதரணம் லங்காபுரி தாகனம் பச்சாத் ராவண கும்பாகரண ஹனனம் ஏதாதி ராமாயணம் so technically i have just finished reciting the ramayana but if we go into the history of the entire epic then you will know that actually it took the original author sri valmiki maharishi several years to compose this wonderful work but why does he call it ramayanam why is it not called ramakatha or ramacharitra why is it called ramayanam this is where we have to understand the significance or the philosophy that goes behind or that has come to us in the form of ramayana so if you take all the holy books the vedas the upanishads the smritis the shastras we have two great itihasas in india one is shrimad ramayana the other one is shrimad mahabharatam right both are incarnations of lord vishnu rama in ramayana was the seventh incarnation and krishna although the yugas were different right one was treta yuga the other was dwapara yuga 
and Krishna was the eighth avatar there. Mahabharatam teaches you four things, or can be broken up into four parts, right? First is called Yaksha Prasanna, then comes Viduraniti, then comes Bhagavad Gita, which is on the first day of the war, and then on the 18th day of the war, we had the gift of Sahasranama, Vishnu Sahasranama. So, Bhagavad Gita on the first day of the war, the war lasted 18 days. Hence, Bhagavad Gita is made of 18 chapters. On the first day, Bhagavan started speaking to Arjuna. Arjuna was the mind, Krishna was the intellect. Always the intellect has to speak to the mind so that everything falls in harmony. But Srimad Mahabharatam with Krishna, it was no secret that Krishna was Lord. He was God with so much of powers. There was no secret about that because he was born as, you know, a Purusha, Deva Purusha. But with Ramayanam, Rama was born as an ordinary being. The difference between that is, the lesson for us is, you can reach God as a normal human being. And that is the lesson of the Ramayana. How, as an ordinary person, one can become so close to God and in fact become God itself. Also in the Ramayana it says, that Sri Hanuman became so close to Rama, that his bhakti until today is reverberating as far as the name Rama is concerned, right? Earlier I said, Sahasranama Tattulyam Rama Nama Varanani. That means the mention of the word Rama is equivalent to actually reciting or listening to the entire Sahasranama. How is that possible? Rama is only two syllables. How is saying Rama equivalent to reciting the entire Sahasranam, thousand names? Well, the word Rama is a very powerful, very powerful syllable. The two is Ra and Ma, right? This is where the connection between the two Trimurtis, which is now your Trimurtis, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, right? Brahma is the creative energy. Vishnu as the preserving energy and Shiva as the determinative or destructive energy. You will see that Brahma only creates but and gives boons to everybody in terms of what they want according to their tapas and discipline and so on and so forth. It is always Vishnu or Shiva who solves the problem created by the gift of the boons as a result of complete tapasya. So Valmiki, in writing about the Ramayana, and this goes back, right? You will see different scholars at different times attribute a different timeline between 500 BCE and 100 BCE. He wrote the Ramayana in seven cantos or karnas or kandams as they say, right? Seven cantos, 500 paragraphs, and 24,000 verses. 24,000 verses, right? It's not necessary for us to know all the 24,000. It is enough for us to know the power behind the name Rama. So even if you say Sri Ramajayam, right? And I will tell you how your thought is so powerful, right? Because when I came here today, I was thinking, where will they ask me to sit and speak? Because during my 10-week uh, religious courses, I sat in front of the Molestanam. So I thought, are they going to sit me there? I would actually like to sit in front of Rama because if he is at the back of me, I don't have to worry who else is there or isn't there. He is behind me. And uh, the Acharya said, you sit here and you talk. So that is the power of your thoughts and that is the power of the divine. When you make a connection subconsciously, you know, conscious thoughts when repeated becomes subconscious, subconscious thoughts 
relates to the superconscious and brings to reality in terms of manifesting those thoughts. Okay, so seven cantos, it starts with Balakantam, right? The time when Rama was born and he is young, going up to the teens. And then Ayodhya Kantam, what happens in Ayodhya after he marries Sita and they come back. Then the drama that takes place there that leads to Aranya Kantam. Aranya means forest. So his life in the forest. You know the Vanavasa period, 14 years. And then Kishkindakin, where he meets, where Rama meets Sugriva and Hanuman. It's a very powerful Kandam. Then comes Sundara Kandam, right? If you listen to many people who know about this, they will tell you if you have any problems in life, if you are going through difficulties, you should read the Sundara Kandam. And I will explain why when we cover Sundara Kandam in a few days' time. Sundara Kandam, then it leads to Yuddha Kandam, the war between Rama and Ravana, and then finally Uttara Kandam, or the, you know, epilogue. The closure, the concluding part of Ramayana. So these are the seven kantas or cantos or kandams. Uh, today I will give you the introduction and talk about Bala Kandam. Tomorrow I will talk about Ayodhya Kandam, right? And then Aranya Kandam, Kishkinda Kandam, Sundara Kandam, Yuddha Kandam, and Uttara Kandam. So this talk will take place every day from about 7:30 to 8:30. It would be great if you can come every day and listen to it because then you have gone the complete cycle, right? From the day they told me or they asked me to speak, I have read the Ramayana a few times, but I started all over again, you know, just to make sure that in the hour that I have been given, I squeeze the essence out of each kanta and give you what you need to live this life in this day and age. So I am not going to be telling you a story in, in terms of what happened, you know, to whom, where, how, why. My job is to translate what happened to today's life so that you can see, ah, this is the lesson for us. This is what we should be doing or this is what we shouldn't be doing. And that is the lesson, right? It's called translation through information. And that is what we are going to be doing. Okay? So let's start with how this entire thing came about. So we go back in time to a kingdom called the Kosala Kingdom where the great king Dasharatha ruled, right? Everybody knows Dasharatha as the father of Rama, but Dasharatha himself was a very powerful king who ruled righteously over many, many, many years. Because in those days, you know, we talk about Brahmic years, now we talk about human years, so it is different. So sometimes in some places you read, Dasharatha ruled the Kausalya kingdom, the Kausala kingdom for 60,000 years. Don't panic, it is true, but in reflection of the time in that yuga. Now it's Kali yuga, it's human years, right? In Satya yuga, Treta yuga, Dvapara yuga, it was all different calculations. So what does Dasharatha mean? What does he stand for? Dasha means ten, Ratha means chariot, right? So, he is one who is referred to as ten chariots. Ten chariots. Now here, we must understand why he was called that. Technically, we can look at it in two ways. One way is, you have your pancha indriyas, your five senses of perception. And you have your jnana indriyas, your five senses of organic senses. Pancha Indriyas 5, Jnana Indriyas 5. So 5 plus 5 is 10. So he is the one, apparently, who has mastered or harmonized the Pancha Indriyas with the Jnana Indriyas. So he was called Dasharatha. However, as a warrior, you know, the, such a big kingdom was conquered by Dasharatha. 
he was called dasharatha because he was gifted with the ability of riding the chariot in all the directions okay now normally when you see the acharyas they do puja right they, there is one part which is called ashtadik palaka puja that is the eight directions so we have north south east and west then we have northeast northwest southeast southwest all together how many eight right one up and one down is 10 but you see again i'll explain to you why during aranya gandam why rama had to go for 14 years what is the secret behind the 14 years again 14 7 refers to the lokas up and 47 refers to the lokas down right up means you have Bhuloka, Bhuvaloka, Subaloka, Mahaloka, Janaloka, Tapaloka and Satyaloka. Seven levels. If you go downwards, right, then you have Atala Loka, Atala Loka, Mathala Loka, Thatala Loka, like that, seven levels. Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Tala, Thatala, Mahatala, Patala, seven. So, as an incarnation, he had to go through those 14 years in respect of each one of the lokas up and the lokas down. But Dasharatha himself, eight directions, one up and one down. So, he was called Dasharatha. That is why he was such a powerful warrior. He could ride his chariot in any direction. There was no problem for him at all. That is Dasharatha. So, Dasharatha had three wives, correct? Kausalya. Kaikeyi and Sumitra. These three wives refer to the three gunas. Satya guna or Satvik guna or you have the second guna is called Rajasik guna and the third one is called Tamasik guna. Kausalya, Rama's mother was deemed to be the Sattva guna, Satvik guna, balanced quality. As a human being, all of us have these qualities within us. Sometimes we are balanced. Sometimes we are rajasic, angry. Sometimes you are tamasic, lazy, ignorant. The job is to move from rajasic or from tamasic to rajasic, rajasic to sattvic. So as an indicator, the three ladies represent sattvic guna, rajasic guna and kaikeyi, tamasic guna. Okay? Now, he was such a powerful king. Everything was working fine. The people of Kausala loved him because he was such a righteous king. But he had one problem. He had no progeny. You know, progeny, lineage. It's called parampara. So he was a very sad king. So he went to the Kulaguru, right? In the Rama Sampradaya, you have two Kulagurus. One is Vashishta or Maharishis and Vamadeva Maharishi. So Dasharatha approached Vashistha Maharishi and asked, what is the issue? Why am I not gifted with a child? So Vashistha said, to beget a child, you must do, you must perform two yajnas. One is called Ashwamedha Yajna. Ashwa means ten, Medha means horses, ten horses. And after that, you must do something called Putra Kame Eshti Yajna. Only when you do these two, then you will get the fruits of this Yajna, which is begetting a son. Then Dasharatha asks, will you be able to perform this? And Vashisha says, I am not fit for it. Vashisha is a Maharishi. But he said he is not fit to be performing this Yajna. So then Dasharatha asks, so what do I do? Who do I seek? Then Vashishta tells him, you have to go and find this Rishi called Rishyamukha. Where do I find him? Shringeri. You know where Shringeri is? Is one of the main places where Adi Shankara went and established a Piram there. One of the four places where the Piram is. So, they went and they seek 
Rishyamukha Rishi, he comes and the preparations are starting for the Ashwamedha Yajna to be followed by the Putra Kameshti Yajna. Everything is being prepared. At the same time, this is happening in Bhuloka, in Bharatava. In the heavens, right? Brahma is being visited by all the Devas. The Devas have come and say, Brahma Deva, we have a problem. Right? They have gone to Brahma Loka. Always when there is a problem, you go to the creator, isn't it? And the creator will send you to the sustainer. The sustainer will tell you to the, send you to the destroyer who destroys your problem. Right? Destruction, don't take it in the physical sense. It is in the energy, right? You have the power to create, you have the power to sustain, and you yourself have the power to destroy. And that is what takes you in this samsara, in this journey of life, from the level of manusha to purusha. Hmm? If you control what is in your mashtaka and not focus so much on the pushtaka, then you will go to Devaloka. So, Brahma said, okay, Devas, what is the problem? Indra is there, Surya is there, Agni is there, all. They have come and said, look, you have given a boon to this Rakshasa called Ravana, and he is now creating so much of problems. He is controlling Bhuloka, he is controlling Bhuvaloka, and he is also trying to come to Devaloka and control us. There is no one to stop him. Why? Because you have given him a boon. He asked for a boon and you said, Tatas, too. So be it, as you wish. So now we are facing the problem. So Brahma said, don't worry. Let us go and seek Vishnu. Vishnu. So where does Vishnu reside? Hmm? Vaigunda Loka. So they go to Vaigunda Loka. And of course, he is on the Sir Shira Sagara ocean of milk, right? Sri Lakshmi and Sri Narayana are known as Divya Dambadi, right? The auspicious couple. And Brahma says, if you surrender to this auspicious couple, this Divya Dambadi, who is Lakshmi Narayana, your problems will be solved. That is why another name for Ramayanam from the spectacle of Valmiki is also called Sharanagati Shastram. Sharanagati Shastram. Sharanagati means surrender. So Brahma takes them to Vaikuntha and there they tell Vishnu, this is the problem. Ravana is beyond control, so somebody has to deal with him. So Vishnu asks Brahma, what did he ask you for? You know, these Rakshasas, they are very, very powerful people. They, their discipline, as far as their tapas is concerned, is unmatched. Even the Devas don't do tapasya like that. If they go into tapasya, it is unmatched, unparalleled. They will go on until they achieve what they are seeking. Right? This is called Ekadrishti, one-pointed devotion, one-pointed concentration, one-pointed focus. So, when he finally managed to appease Brahma and Brahma appeared, he asked, he said, I must be the most powerful person on this earth. I cannot be defeated by any Yakshas, Gandharvas, Karanas, everybody, he said, from man to animal to God to everything, he said, but he forgot to mention two categories. One was normal human beings. Now in Sanskrit, normal hum human beings is called Naraha. And another category that he forgot to mention is Vanaraha. Vanaraha is monkeys. So he said, I cannot be destroyed by anybody except no, he didn't say accept, but he said everything, but he did not include Naraha, which is man, and Vanaraha, which is monkey. Va means, you know, in Tamil, Va is Vala. So if you remove the Va from Vanaraha, what do you get? Naraha. So as human beings, we also have a tail. The tail is called the mind, Manas. That's where all the problems are created. 
and it is sustained through our kriyas, our powers of action, and that we beget the fruits, the consequences of our own actions. So Vishnu says that means I have to take birth as a normal human person without any powers, without any, you know, godly powers, without any divine powers. And I need monkeys to help me defeat this Ravana. So he says, Indra, you will be born as Bali. Okay. Surya, you will be born as Sugriva. Okay. Then he called Vishwakarma, you will be born as Nala. Agni Deva, you will be born as Nila. Now you know Nala and Nila are the ones who were responsible for building the bridge, especially Nala. But Nala, Vishwakarma, is a celestial architect. You know, all the celestial abodes, whether it's in Brahma Loka, Vishnu Loka, or Shiva Loka, is created by the creative energy of Vishwakarma. So, can you imagine if he is reborn as Nala? What is going to happen? So all these people were drafted in. And Vishnu said, I will be born as Rama. So all this story they are telling to Brahma and the Devas. While in the Bhuloka, all the preparations are happening to conduct the Ashwamedha Yajna followed by the Putra Kamyashti Yajna. Okay? So follow the story carefully because therein lies the significance. Now, what does Vishnu rest on? Hmm? It's called Adi Shesha, right? Now, in every avatar, if you look at the lineage of the Dashavataram, from Matsya avatar, to Kurma avatar, to Varaha avatar, to Narasimha avatar, Vamana avatar, Parasurama avatar, Rama, Krishna, Buddha, like that. Always, Adi Shesha has played a role whenever Bhagavan takes an incarnation. And Bhagavan will definitely take an incarnation because that is his divine assurance. He has said very clearly, right? He, he reminded Arjuna. He said, Paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya chatuskritham dharma samstavanarthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. He said, You don't have to worry. Mam suchaha. Don't worry. Mam ekam sharanam raje. Just surrender to me. See, just surrender to me. This was Krishna to Arjuna. The same thing Brahma is telling the Devas, just surrender to the Divya Tampadi who is Lakshmi Narayana. So Adi Shesha is saying, Bhagavan, you can't go without me. Adi Shesha, you will be born as Lakshmana. So what does Bhagavan have in his hands? What is he called? Chang Chakra Gadadhari. Chang Chakra Gadam. On one hand is always Abhaya Hasta. Why fear when I am here? Right? Chang said, don't leave me. I am destitute without you. Chakra said, you and I have never parted ways. We are always together. I am constantly spinning. Actually, it is said in the Garuda Purana, that this, in this Kali Yuga, the entire world is run by Sudarshana Chakra. Oh, so over there, straight ahead, with 16 hands, right? I have spoken about Vishnu and all his amsas during my 10-week religious course. Uh, the link will be available from the temple website. You can have a look. And if possible, we'll also try and put it on the temple website so people don't have to go here and there. Uh, on Vishnu. So there is something I said about Sudarshana Chakra there. So Vishnu said, Chang will be Bharata and Chakra will be Shatraguna. So you see, he came with his team. The whole team was down. But he said, You will not know who you are, as will I. So I, born as Rama, I will not know that I am Vishnu. 
you will not know your adishesha you will not know your shangha you will not know chakra and indra you will not know who you are so surya you won't know vishwakarma you won't know agni deva you won't know but we will all be born as normal persons Now that is the power why because the way in which ravana's boon was given right so what we ask god we must be very careful because if we ask it you know sometimes when you think something and when you speak as you think what you say does not come out according to what you intended have you ever experienced that you're thinking something but when you say it, it's completely different right so they say you need some nidhanam you need some a sense of balance so the sattvic guna you must have right when you want to ask god for something you must think very carefully and ask very slowly right here narada is telling valmiki a story right even valmiki has a history you know valmiki was not a born rishi he was a dacoit and a thief so how did he become a maharishi right it's just like vishwamitra i'll come to him in a bit vishwamitra was not a, a rishi he was a king just like he got he gave up and he went through so many yugas thousands of years before he finally attained the status of maharishi from brahma brahma refused to give him you know he got so many titles rishi yuga rishi raja rishi he was still not satisfied he said i want the highest accolade given to rishis which is maharishi so he said okay fine you are maharishi so narava narada said there is a story about a mosquito mosquito you know mosquito mm. so this mosquito did tapas and brahma appeared before the mosquito and he said what do you want i am pleased with your sense of devotion what is it that you want see the mosquito in its eagerness to ask you know what mosquitoes do isn't it <laughs> the way it came out it said should die when i bite that's what it asked brahma brahma said tatas too what it wanted to ask was whoever i bite should die that's what it wanted to ask but when it asked is it should die when i bite so it wasn't clear who should die therefore brahma thought oh you should die when you bite now you know what happens when mosquitoes bite you what happens they die straight away isn't it because you kill them so god will give you what you ask for therefore you need to exercise what something called trikarana suddhi which is a balance in your thoughts words and actions in order to ask the right thing only if you ask the right thing can you manage yourself with that if you ask for wealth and you do not know how to manage wealth then it's going to destroy your life if you ask for too much of knowledge and you do not know how to manage the knowledge it will also destroy your life and the prime example for that is ravana he is called dashamukha that means he's got 10 heads again what is the significance of the 10 heads in the entire hindu pantheon in all the shastras and all the puranas and all the stories that you hear no one is more learned more educated than ravana that is why in the entire hindu gods and goddesses only two gods have got the title of ishwaran one is sanishwaran the other is ravaneshwaran why because their status is there and everybody fears them now 10 heads represents the four vedas rigveda yajurveda samaveda adharvana veda and the six shastras all the shastras he had you know squeezed it into a, a drink and he's drunk it so he is a complete owner of all this knowledge that is why even in the battlefield when i'm talking about yuddha kandam i will tell you how as a brahmin in the yuddha he came to do rama's devasha prayers you know rama had to offer prayers to dasharatha he couldn't find a brahmin priest on the yuddha 
on the battlefield. But he knew Ravana was a learned Brahmin and he could perform the, the puja for him. So he sent word and Ravana respected that and came and did the puja right, for Rama and then went back and they continued. This was the what we call Yuddha Dharmam. Even in the battlefield, they had laws which they observed and respected. Whether you see Ramayana or Mahabharatam, it's the same. Right? Mahabharatam, the war started at sunrise with the blowing of the conch. It ended with the sunset again with the blowing of the conch. After that, they were brothers. They helped each other and in the morning they fight. So, dharmic thing. This is the whole Gita came about because Arjuna was confused whether he is to kill his own brethren, his kith and kin. See, I can see Bhishma Charya, I can see Drona Charya, these are all my gurus, my uncle, my cousins. How do I shoot an arrow to them? Krishna says, do your duty, don't worry about the results. So the whole war was stopped while Krishna is instructing Arjuna. And that is what on the first day of the war, we have Bhagavad Gita. On the 18th day of the war, right, as Bhishma Chara is lying on the bed of arrows, this day is celebrated as Bhishma Yekadashi, right, comes, uh, well, it came already earlier, sometime in April. And he gifted us with the thousand names of Lord Vishnu, which is Vishnu Sahasranam, on the 18th day. So, here, same thing, because Ravana did not use all the knowledge that he had acquired, right, properly, it led to his destruction. So everything was already arranged. Just before Vishnu said, okay, Brahma, you can go, Devas, you can go, Lakshmi said, what about me? You are taking Adishesha, you are taking your Shang, you are taking your Chakra, you are taking all the Devas to help you. What about me? Aren't you known as Lakshmi Narayana, Sita Rama, hmm? Devaki Nandana? Why are you forsaking me? So Vishnu said, you will be born as Sita and I will come and seek you out at the right time. Okay, so after that, now from the heavens we come back to the earth. The rest of the story will continue here until the Uttarakhandam when we go back. This is what I said. Whenever there is a decline in righteousness or moral aptitude, God will incarnate from age to age. Anyway, so let us look at now what is happening, everything is prepared and the Ashwamedha Yajna starts successfully completed by Rishya Mukharishi and then they start the Putra Kameshti Yajna and at the end, now you have observed when the Acharyas here do Havan or Homam, what is the final thing called? The final offering to Agni Deva, it is called Purnahuti. Hmm? Purna Ahuti, the final offering, completion. Purna means to complete. Right? So, when they were going to offer the Purna Ahuti, and as they offered, out came a divine being. This is called Yajna Purusha. He is the one who receives everything that you give to Agni Deva. Right? And Agni Deva receives everything and brings it to one state of being. That is the power of fire. If you take the Panjabhutas, the only thing that cannot be polluted is fire. Earth can be polluted, water can be polluted, air can be polluted, space can be polluted, but fire can never be polluted. That is why all these things are used in the Hindu Sampradayas, in the Hindu Pujas, especially fire. It is a strong medium of connection between Manusha and Purusha through this Oma Karmas. So Yajna Purusha came with a golden vessel, with a kalash, golden kalash, which had payasam inside, Deva Amritam. And he gave it to Vashishta. He said, Give this to Dasharatha to give to his wives. 
So Dasharada takes the vessel and he goes first to Kausalya and he gives 50% of the contents to Kausalya. Then he goes to Sumitra and he gives 25% to Sumitra. Then he goes to Kaikeyi, so 50 plus 25, a bit of maths now. 50 plus 25 is 75, okay. Then he goes to Kaikeyi and he gives her 12 and a half percent of what is remaining. So how much is remaining? 12 and a half. This is one more portion, what do I do with it? Right? And he's thinking, I will give it to one of my wives who come next. And who should come but Sumitra. So Sumitra had this payasam twice. And that is why she had twins. Lakshmana and Shatraguna. Now, everybody is so used to talking about Rama, Lakshmana, Rama, Lakshmana, Rama, Lakshmana. Actually, Lakshmana was not born second. First Rama was born. Then, who was next? Bharata was born next. He is the second son. Then only Lakshmana and Shatraguna was born as twins. Right? But the connection, you see the connection, who is Lakshmana? Adi Shesha. So Lakshmana was more connected to Rama. And of course, Shangha Chakra, Bharata and Shatraguna, they were connected in a sense. So they were always together, Bharata and Shatraguna, and Rama and Lakshmana were together in all their trials and tribulations. Very interesting. But if you look at Rama's, you know, whenever somebody is born in modern times, we look at something called Jodisha Shastram. Remember, they'll ask, oh, when were you born? What, uh, <coughs> what Masam, what Paksham, what Tidi, what Lagnam? Like that they'll ask, isn't it? Now, Rama was born in Chaitra Masam, Chitra Masam, Shukla Paksham, Navami Tidi. Hence, we celebrate Rama Navami. Punar Vasu Nakshatram, or Punar Pusam, as we know it. And the Lagnam was Karkatham. Now, according to Jodisha Shastram, this, if you ask people who see Jodita, they will say, they will refer to this as Panchoche Lokanayakaha. Panchoche Lokanayakaha. That means, where these five are in alignment, you will be the ruler of the universe. So, Rama was born at the perfect timing during all this alignment of all these planets. The correct month, Chitramasam, Shukla Paksham, Navamitidi, Pudarvasu Nakshatram, Karkatkara, Lagnam. So it was planned. Then, of course, Bharatha was born. The next after Punarvasu is Pushyam or Pusam. Then Lakshmana and Shatraguna, Ashlesha, Nakshatram, or what we know as Ayulyam. So these four were born, and these planets were in perfect alignment. Of course, when God is born, nothing can stand in the way of what he wants to happen. No one can stand in the way of the will of God. The will of God is sharper than the sharpest blade. But he was born like that. But if you look at uh, Mahabharata and Krishna, Krishna was born in the total opposite, Ashtami. Born to someone in prison. Had to cross the ocean, you know. So it was complete opposite. Rama was, everything was superb. Why? Because Rama was born as a normal human being without any power. So all, everything else gave hand, lent their support. Whereas Krishna was being born as God. Therefore he didn't need anything because he can manage it. Right? So that happened. And then, of course, the four babies were born. It was time to name the babies. And of course, the Kulaguru, who is Vashishtamuni, he was given the task of naming the babies. Of course, Vashishta, in his divine perception, he knew who Rama was, who Lakshmana was, and he knows what was going to happen. You know, he knows Vishwamitra is going to come and take Rama and Lakshmana away. He knows they're going to go and kill the demons in the Aranya in the forest and then they're going to go to Mithila and the Swayamvara is going to take. He knows all of that. So he names them accordingly, right? He named Rama as Rama because he was Maryada Purushottaman. He was a Dharma Purusha. 
Nothing he does is adharmic. Everything was righteous. Just like, you know, Yudhishthira in Mahabharata, he was Dharma Raja, like that. Why was Bharata called Bharata? Because Bharata was called Bharata because Bharata Rajya Bharana. That means one who has the capacity to rule Bharat, India. But did he actually rule India or, or rule the kingdom? He had the power to rule it, but he chose not to rule, but he put Rama's hmm, sandals, Kamalapada. That is why in our Sampradayas, we always worship the feet. Right? Even when the Acharyas do Abhishekam, you must see that they never start from the top. They always start from the feet. And even in medical science, doctors, I'm sure you'll agree with me, they say when you bathe, you should wet your feet first and not your head straight away. Because it's one of the, one of the uh, causes of uh, lack of uh, supply of oxygen to the head, which causes strokes or heart attacks. So they say wet your feet first always. Again, the medical science. So he named Bharata, Bharata because of Bharata Rajya Bharana. And Lakshmana, who was born to Sumitra, why was he called Lakshmana? Lakshmana Lakshmi Sampannaha. That means one who serves Lakshmi. Right? But he served Rama, of course, where Sita was. You can see in most of the times Rama left Lakshmana to, to guard and guide Sita, even when he went to look for the golden deer. Correct? So, in that sense, he called Lakshmana, Lakshmana Lakshmi Sampannaha. The one who serves Lakshmi through service, but the service of serving Lakshmi reaches Narayanaha. Then Shatrugna. Shatruna Hana Iti Shatraguna. One who has the power to kill. Shatrus means enemies. But if you look at Ramayana, Shatruna never actually defeated anybody. It was either Rama or Lakshmana or Hanuman. Correct? Shatrugna played a role, but he never really defeated anybody. So, how do we relate to this in our day-to-day -day -day life? What is our Shatrus? Shatru means enemy, right? So, who are your enemies? Where does your enemy live? Within you, and not outside of you. Your enemies are actually within you. If you can find them and kill them, then you don't have any problem outside. All problems start from inside. So, all your thoughts. Hey, your thoughts. Go to a good place? No. Go to a bad place. Thoughts will tell you. Don't do this? No. Do this. Don't lie? No. Lie. Ah, those are your Shatrus. Right? If you see Lord Shiva as uh, Nadaraja, you see that he's dancing on a baby, isn't it? Yes? Do you see that? Yeah. Many of my uh, colleagues, white professors have asked me this. Said, Why is your Lord Shiva dancing on a little baby? I said, to you it's a little baby, but to me, that is a demon called Apasmara Purusha. That demon is representative of the Ashta Doshas of human beings. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Moha, Mada, Mamada, Marsarya, Ahamkara. Eight Doshas. And Shiva is dancing on those Doshas because he is the master. He has conquered all these Doshas. So he is dancing the dance of victory. Likewise, your Shatrus are inside you. Kama, Krodha, Lobha, Moha, Mada, Mamada, Matsarya, Ahamkara. Biggest enemy is Ahamkara. You know what is Ahamkara? Ego. Only when he go, he come. He. Ego must go for God to come. What must you do therefore? You do good. G-O-O-D. Because when you do good, in the good there is God. G-O-D. Correct or not? Simple formulas for you to live your life. That's why he says, Dharma samstavan arthaya sambhavami yuge yuge. Whenever there is a decline in righteousness, I will come from age to age to take you through. So, the naming ceremony is over. Then the actual Balakandam starts, you know, during Rama's childhood time. How even as a child, he was always very fair 
and he was a perfect child. He was a perfect child to the father, the perfect child to all three mothers. Right? Because he always says, Janani Janma Bhumischa, Swarga Dapi Ghari Yasi. That means, my mother and motherland are even more dearer to me than Swarga. So all three mothers he treated with safe. Matru Devo Bhava. First God is your mother. Hmm? That is why Shankara says, Nasti Ganga Samathi Tham. There is no greater Tita than Ganga. Right? <coughs> Nastri Matu Samo Devo Samo Guru. There is no greater Guru than your mother. Nasti Vishnu Samo Devaha. And finally, he says, You have to respect your mother. And Krishna asks Arjuna once, If I am here, your Guru is here, and your mother is here. Who do you prostrate to first? Arjuna says, to you, my Lord. He says, no. If you prostrate to me, I will leave. And to my Guru, no. First Guru is Mother. Always remember. Matru Devo Baba. Then only, even if you don't prostrate to me, is enough. Because if your mother says, protect, I have to protect. Like that, the power is there. So he respected, as a mother, he, as a son to the mother, he was perfect. As a brother to his brothers, he was perfect. As a friend, Mitra, to his friends, he was perfect. As a crown prince, he was a perfect leader to all the people. So they loved him. Right? But when he turned 12, right? that's when the actual story of Balakanda actually starts. Balakanda is actually during his Brahmacharyam times. And you know, a man's life is divided into four stages. Brahmacharyam, Grahastam, Vanapadishtam, and Sanyasam. Four stages. So, if you take these four stages and apply it to Balakandam, Brahmacharyam is Balakandam. Up to the point he goes to Mithila, seeks Sita after the Swayamvara. Then comes Ayodhya Kandam, he moves to the next stage, which is Grahastha. That's Ayodhya Kandam, Maranya Kandam. Then, of course, his wife is taken away. He is Vanapadishtha. He is seeking, he is lonely, he is destitute. And then finally, she comes back, but because of certain vidhi, they can't live together, she goes away, right? And he lives as a sannyasa. And they never get back together, because the day Rama accepts his son, I'm talking about Uttaragandam, Lava and Kusha, that's the day she goes back to Mother Earth. That's why she's called Janaki, one who is born of Earth. Okay? Also, Adi Shankara says, Bala stavat prida saktaha, Taruna stavat taruni saktaha, Vridha stavat chinta saktaha, Parame brahmane kopina saktaha. He said, when you're a child, you're attached to play things. Then when you're grown up as a young person, you're attached to the opposite sex. Taruna stavat taruni saktaha. Then, Vridha stavat chinta saktaha. That means when you're growing old, you're attached to your thoughts, your worries. What is going to happen to this? What is going to happen to that? Who is going to take care? Everything you're attached. This is talking about attachment. And finally, Parame Brahmane Ko Pinasakta. At last, to the one power that can save you, nobody is attached. Nobody is attached. Adi Shankara says. So, Rama, because of his attachment to everything, and particularly of his father's attachment to him, he was the apple of Dasharatha's eye. Vishwamitra came when he turned 12 and he told Dasharatha. Before that, you know, the rishis when they come, they have a very uh, powerful way of asking for something which cannot be refused. So Vishwamitra says, Dasharatha, will you grant whatever I ask for? Dasharatha had everything. Now he also had four sons. So he says, What is it that I cannot give you, O Rishi? Ask. I want Rama to come with me because I cannot perform the yajnas because the Rakshasas are getting in the way. Therefore, I need your son Rama to ward off these evil spirits in the Rakshasas. Dasharada said, but Rama is only 12. I will send you my entire battalion of army. 
Vishwamitra said, you don't forget what you told me. You said, ask and I will give. Then Vashishta told Dasharatha, don't worry, Vishwamitra is not an ordinary Rishi. There must be a reason why he is asking for Rama. You have to keep your words. So, of course, when Rama went, he already knew that Lakshmana will come with him. Hmm? So they both went with Vishwamitra. And Vishwamitra takes them and he goes to the forest. Now, first thing, you know, they go on a boat that is provided and they cross the Sarayu Nadhi, the river Sarayu, right? And then they reach the forest, the Aranya, and then Vishwamitra starts his Yajna. And suddenly, out of the blue comes this demon called Tataka. Tataka Rakshasa. And Rama automatically takes his arrow, shoots, and kills this demon. And Vishwamitra continues the Yajna and completes it properly. As a result of which, he taught Rama and Lakshmana two very powerful mantras which will allow them to live in any condition. It is called the Bhala and Athibala mantra. Right? Then he said, don't worry, because Vishwamitra knew who Rama was, although Rama didn't know who he was. Vishwamitra knew. So he said, I will equip you with all the astras. You know, now we say nuclear weapon, biological weapon, all this, right? In those days it was astras. Of course, the most powerful weapon was Brahmastram. Right? And we know in Mahabharata it was used, you know, three or four times. So similarly, he gave tutelage to Rama and Lakshmana to an extent where they became excellent warriors and they had mastered all this. So after defeating Tataka, they went again on their journey and they reached an ashrama called Siddhashrama. Siddhashrama. Okay? There, Vishwamitra said, I have to do a six day yajna here. Six day. Hmm? Okay, started. First day went fine, second day went, because Rama and Lakshmana are security guards, they're waiting there, right? Now, on the sixth day, suddenly, two demons came called Maricha. Maricha, not Marichi. Marichi comes later, okay? Maricha and Subahu. So Rama used the Manava Astram to kill Maricha and he uses the Agni Astram to kill Subahu. He kills them. So the Yajna gets completed and they move on on their journey. See, this was a specific reason why they were going through. Then they reached another ashram called Gautama Ashram. Famous Rishi Gautama and his beautiful wife called Ahalya. And because of some issues, you know, domestic issues, <laughs> right? Ahalya was cursed to become a stone because you're so full of vanity, you think beauty is everything, you will be reduced to a stone, a small stone. And you will not come out of this curse until a pure man, a pure human being, a dharma purusha, a maryada purushottama, unless one of this type comes and his feet touches you, then yes. And of course, when they reached Gautama Ashram, as he was walking, what happened? His feet touched this rock and the rock automatically took the shape of Ahalya and she was restored to a Papa Vimochana. He was given Rama. So I said, Sahasranama Tattulyam Rama Nama Varanani. Just the word Sri Rama. Ra stands for Narayana. Nara. Ra is the second syllable. And Ma comes from Shiva. Nama Shivaya. So, second syllable of Narayana and the second syllable of Lord Shiva. Ra, Ma. Can you imagine these powers together? On their own, they are so powerful. Can you imagine if they are joint? That is why Sri Rama Rama Rame Eti Rame Rame Mano Rame Sahasra Nama Tatkulyam Rama Nama Varanani. Just say the name of Sri Rama. And that is the practice why people write Sri Rama Jam. You know this practice of writing Sri Rama Jam, Sri Rama Jam? Not in vain. Everything has a reason, right? We think it is in vain. It is your intent, your action, 
and your thoughts that determine how much success you get. So, right? Ahalya was released from the curse. Just like, you know, he meets Sabari. And Sabari is released from hers. She was only waiting to see him before she gets moksha. Moksha ishyami. He gives moksha. Right? Then, of course, now Vishwamitra is telling Rama and Lakshmana, okay, let's go towards Mithila Nagar. Let's go to Mithila. Of course, Vishwamitra knows why he's going there. Before Vashishta sent him out of uh, Ayodhya, also he knew why and what is going to happen. So they go there, and at that point in time, King Janaka was having, right, what we call a swayamvara. That means you go through a little test before you are entitled, you are qualified to marry somebody. And those days it was really good. Nowadays, no. We just look at shadi.com and say, okay, this one is all right, or that one is all right. Right? No swayamvara. And swayamvara, they had to lift the bow of Lord Shiva, the Danush. The Danush was called Pinakini. And you know, when they say the Sri Rudram, there is three parts where the word Pinakini comes. It is called the bow of Lord Shiva. Very powerful bow. And Sita as a young girl was able to lift it and she used to play with it. So many people have come, all the Rajas, all the princes, Yakshas, Gandharvas, everybody has come, they tried. So Vishwamitra said, Rama, go and try your luck. Now Rama, of course, whatever the Guru says, he will do. So he went, he just lifted it in one hand. Then Vishwamitra said, string the bow for you to put the string. So as he pulled it, he broke the bow into half. So everybody was, you know, surprised that nobody could do this. But this man was able to do this. Surely, he must be a very powerful person. And of course, because he was successful, Janakan said, ah, he is able to marry Sita. But Vishwamitra said, hang on a minute. He is the crown prince of Ayodhya, son of Dasharatha. Let's invite Dasharatha and his wives and the three, uh, sorry, the two, two other sons. So they all came. Janagan had two wives, ah, sorry, two wives, two daughters, right? Sita and Urmila. So Vishwamitra said, Rama is marrying Sita, Lakshmana, you marry Urmila. Right? Then, Bharata and Shatraguna are there. And Vishwamitra knew Janagan has another brother who is a king. He had, he had two daughters as well, right? Mandavi and Shutakriti. Shutakriti. So he says, Bharatha, you marry Mandavi. Shatraguna, you marry Shutakriti. And Dasharatha was agreeable to that. And they all, the four marriages took place at the same time. That is why you see, the Lakshmi Kalyanam, sometimes it takes place in Uttra Palguni Nakshatram. Because that is the day where actually Rama got married to Sita, Rakshmana got married to Urmila and so on and so forth. So it was a very powerful. So technically that's where, you know, also the song, Rama Kalyanam Vaibhohame, Sita Kalyanam Vaibhohame. So therein, the Balakandam ends because after the marriage, they all go back to Ayodhya. So Ayodhya Kandam then starts. So tomorrow, 7.30 sharp, I will be starting on Ayodhya Kandha. Okay? So let us end with a, a short bhajan. So that we give credence to Rama through the medium of devotion or bhakti. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Shabbat
ಸೃಷ್ಟಿ ಪ್ರಜಾಭ್ಯಾಂ ಪರಿಪಾಲಯಂಥಾಂ ನ್ಯಾಯೇನ ಮಾಧ್ಯೇನ ಮಹೀ ಮಹೀಷಾ ಗೋ ಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೇಭ್ಯೋ ಸುಭಮಸ್ತು ನಿತ್ಯಂ ಲೋಕಾ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಸುಖಿನೋ ಭವಂತು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಐ ಹೋಪ್ ಟು ಸಿ ಯು ಟುಮಾರೋ ಫಾಯೋದ್ಯ ಕ